Hey, Purnima, thanks for joining us today. How you doing? Good. Thank you for having me and inviting me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, um, I'm a big fan of uh, women in tech, and, and I just through researching and bumping into some sites, uh, I noticed fem Femgineer is something that you're doing, and, and also this uh, Busy Bee. So, uh, why don't you briefly get into Busy Bee? I, I know that you're doing two things there. To talk about that. What, what, what's the itch you're trying to scratch? Why, why, are you, why are you doing this? Sure. Well, I have been practicing yoga for nine and a half years now. And originally when I started Busy B, it was after a six-year practice. And one of the things that I just noticed in those six years was how much the industry had grown, both in terms of studios and practitioners and instructors. Okay. But I, after volunteering at a few studios and doing some business consulting, noticed that people weren't making the best use of technology. And part of that was, you know, there were some key players, not a whole lot, but there were some competitors in the space. Um, but their products were just too much, right? Like they couldn't deal with um, a sales force or uh, something that requires a lot of insulation um, because they're not particularly interested in technology. They're more interested in serving their students, right? Okay. Okay. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt yeah. you here. So you're so you were into the yoga space. You, you had your own studio, and you were looking for software to help manage your your studio. Is that right? Well, I wasn't a studio. I don't own a studio. Okay. I was just consulting for a couple studios back gotcha. in 20, 2010 like when I started Busy Bee. And, and you felt they were too complicated. You felt they were just too much for the, the owners of these studios. Well, that's what they right. told me. Because when I asked why they weren't using a software Brick system, mortar, uh, most of them said, well, it's just too complicated. And it takes a lot of training and it takes a lot of maintenance in order right. to even put something in place. Gotcha. This is a. Yeah, not worth a burden. Yeah, this this is a common thing that we hear from a lot of people that aren't into tech and are busy running their businesses. They want really simple solutions. This is a very common problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So okay, so you you felt okay, well Salesforce is too complicated, these guys need something. Yeah. Maybe. So so we do have a couple competitors in the space, but what we noticed was that the ones, like I said, who were pretty small, you know, mom and pops, or uh, a lot of them were sole proprietors just getting their business off the ground, didn't really have the time to sit there and install software or train themselves or train employees. And so we wanted to build something that was just sure. really super push button. Um, and it was coming right after my uh, Mint acquisition, so that's where I was before Busy Bee. Right, and one of the work. great lessons that I learned being on the founding team at Mint was you've got to build right. software that's dead simple. Simple. Especially if it's, yeah, especially if it's yeah. going to be something that's mundane. Like, who wants to manage their personal finances? Same right. thing, who wants to manage their business, right? They want to yeah. be in the business. They want to be meeting customers, but they don't right. want to be managing it. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, they don't yeah. want extra work exactly. They're already busy doing whatever they're doing. This is a chore. So, all right. So, so, all the, so that was a key insight. So, why did you feel like, okay, you know, I'm, uh, th that mint thing was really great. I got hopefully I made a little money out of it. I'm looking for something new to do. Uh, I looked around at the at this at the landscape. What was it that convinced you? Like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. Well, one, I think I just had a lot of domain expertise in the in the field, right? So like I said, I'd been practicing for six years. I knew studios across the country. I knew that it was a very growing market. I didn't see a lot of competition. And I also noticed that these businesses all operate on a similar model. And it, it's not just yoga as one vertical. There are multiple verticals that operate like this. So I knew that there was potential to expand but it's just a matter, like I said, of creating something that is pretty push button and getting the word out because small business owners are hard to reach. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's really hard to get to the small business uh, owner. They're they're bombarded with people calling them for SEO or calling them for whatever it is with the internet. And uh, yeah. Uh, so tell me, how long did it take you to get the first product out? Um, you know that kind of thing. Who built it? Yeah, so um, so I, I actually built a l large portion of the initial prototype, okay. and we um, uh, by mid, I'd say 2010, I had a team in place, was still at this point bootstrapping the business, okay. and within about three to six months, we had the first version out with a um, handful of paying customers, 
And since then, we've been mostly focused on building the product. Um, in the last year, we've shifted gears a lot, um, mostly because of Femgineer, my second business, starting to take over. Right. Um, but in this last year, we've become a little bit more of a remote and part-time team, uh, okay. and most of our effort has gone towards sales and marketing um, with a little bit on product development. Okay, so you said a lot there. So let, let's let's backtrack a little bit. Um, uh, one, uh, you said you got a handful of customers, and you mm -hmm. built part of the product yourself. And so, obviously, you know you're a web developer. You know the space really well. So that helps that you can actually prototype it yourself. Um, how how did you get those first early customers? Did you was it through referrals? How how many weeks or months was it? The very first version. And uh, talk to us about the very early days. Yeah. Well, I actually spent the first six months doing a lot of customer development. Okay. And so it was going to a number of studio owners that were, you know, mainly in my network, but even some that were outside of my network, and really making sure that they were unhappy with products that were out there, right? Because what I didn't want was to deal with folks who would say, oh, well, this is going to be a pain to switch, or yeah, we're happy yeah. with our system. So yeah. I wanted to make sure that there was a clear market demand, not just right. in terms of numbers, but in terms of what people were saying. Okay. And so I spent a good portion of the first half of the year doing that. Okay, really briefly, customer development interviews is a really awesome thing. I love it. I love anybody that does a lot of that due diligence. How, how did you go about reaching out to these yoga studio owners? Did you get them on the phone? Did you find them on LinkedIn? What, what, was, this, what was that early process of just reaching out? Yeah, well, fortunately, I live in California where there's you know basically a yoga studio on every block. Right. So uh, uh, some of it was cold calling people, you know, going up and saying, hey, I don't have anything to sell you because I literally didn't okay. and just said okay. would love to take a yoga class and would also like to talk to you about what I'm building and gotcha. so you know fortunately it's a warm and welcoming community so they would take anywhere from like 15 to 30 but minutes you're to saying talk you went to me in person in um, Dallas, and then though, from there a, you know, some folks would say yes I want to follow up and some would say you know thanks for your time and Thanks for showing up. So um, a lot of it was just doing, you know, reaching out to folks. I have to um, tell you, Purnima, uh, uh, for developers and for a lot of people, uh, cold calling is like the hardest and like scariest thing ever. Um, well, yeah. Okay. And well, you, said you know, I'm less intimidating them, in person. Right? I mean, you were participating <laughs> right? in part of the I mean, group it's hard to tell on the camera, but I'm, you know, five two and pretty petite. So when I show up, people don't get scared, right? People aren't like, oh, she's trying to hard sell us on something. They just think, oh, really nice gal showed up that has a smile on her face. Yeah, I'll talk to her for five minutes. Gotcha. Um, so, so most people find it non-threatening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly, and and sometimes you know if it was if I felt like I was getting a lot of pushback, then um, I would ask for a warm intro. But I never you know shirked away from just walking into a business and you know explaining who I was and why I was there. In fact, when I was visiting New York, um, some people were really I, I'd say impressed that someone would fly all the way across the country yeah. um, just to just to come to their studio and uh, I think they also appreciated that I took the time to meet with them face to face. Well, so l let's also talk more about this customer development. The, the fact that you were really going diving deep, making sure that they were happy to switch, making sure there was really a problem there. How many interviews did you really do until you really felt like, you know what? There really is a problem here. I think we could do some like what was it? Was it like 10, 20, 50? When when did you feel good about doing this? Yeah, it was definitely 50 plus. Um, okay. It was split between myself, my co-founder, my designer. Um, I yeah, basically had the entire team approach, right? get out it, there it, the and even just meet with people kind of because not only were really they getting out to validate the idea, um, but right. they were How also developing some level of empathy How, in the you know, process. And the, sometimes uh, we even got customers that way. So it was necessary for everybody on the team to be involved. I love that. I love it. Yeah. Well, I think at this point, um, you, you know, initially a lot of it was the product learning because we had to understand what they absolutely needed. Uh, I think at this point now it's transitioned to more of a sales learning 
where um, you know people are telling us how they want to be approached. Mm -hmm. um, but in that first, in, the, in those first interviews that we did, a lot of it was the product itself, and we okay. didn't have a product, right? So that was another reason to do it. Um, so I would say, yeah, in the in the first six months, you know, we got close to uh, a handful of customers first, okay. and then once we launched. Um, we started to ramp up our customer base because we had something out there and we put more emphasis into marketing. Okay, so I want to dig more and more into the customer development because I honestly believe this is the one area that a lot of startups don't do enough of, getting out of the building, really talking to end users. Um, so what kind of, what were the, some of the general questions that you'd ask these people just to kind of get them to open up? Do you remember? Yeah, well, I don't know if uh, you've ever been through sales training, but you know, the first thing you want to do is just have that qualification questionnaire, right? Okay. So it's, hey, would you even use studio management software, right? Because some people will be like, nope, I'm totally happy with my index cards or right, my Excel right. spreadsheet or my paper right. and pen, right? right. Yeah, yeah. And then from there, you know, we could take a little bit of time to understand the psyche of why they don't want to switch because we don't want to do a hard sale. But if then they say, yeah, I'd love to use a studio management software, but most things out there are either too complicated or too pricey, then we get a better sense of what their needs are. Um, but really, that first interview is less than 10 minutes, and it's really just qualifying um, the customer as someone who's either interested or disinterested. And even in the interested category, it's what level of interest, right? Are they going to be an early adopter where they feel comfortable? Or are they going to ask us for a boatload of features where right. we're not going to be interesting to them um, until a year or two after we build out our product? Oh, wow, this is great. Uh, yeah, so did you, uh, after the qualification process, after you started building this thing out a little bit, did you go back to those folks that were interested, showing them mock ups? Or how did you, how did you co create the product with them? Yeah, so actually we did. We had, um, like I said, a few folks who were very much interested and uh, almost every month we would go to them, show them uh, paper prototypes. I didn't even show them the finished product until we were you know, getting closer to, to developing it. Yeah. Um, so, so very early on it was a lot of interviews, a lot of back and forth just on paper, some mm -hmm. interaction, some interaction, um, but, the, but the vast majority was just what do you think of this workflow and once again do you still believe in this product category. Um, and then once we were ready to, to launch, then it was here's the final version. Um, and by that point, we had sort of ironed a lot of the initial feature kinks out. So, yeah. I, I just want to get an idea of, uh, again, how many people were part of that paper prototyping process. Mm -hmm. Did you say more than 20 to 40 or less than 20? Can you give me a rough idea? Uh, I'd say a handful of people handful. So let's say 10, 5 or yeah, I would say like more like three to five were okay. heavily involved in, in every step, gotcha. right? Because we'd have this funnel where, sure, people like, you know, 50 to 100 people would do an initial screen. But okay. then after that, we would figure out that they didn't qualify for the next round. Right. Um, so by the time we kind of got to right before launch, it was about three to five very close customers who were giving us feedback on the product. Um, that didn't mean that other people weren't interested. It just right. meant... You know, for us, we also couldn't manage feedback from, from 50 to 100 people. Right. Um, but, but having three to five in a few different personas was also important. So we had one woman who had a 20-year-old business, and she was moving from index cards. Um, we had a second okay. who was a first-time studio owner and really, once again, needed something simple. Was fairly right. tech-savvy, but really right. still wanted something simple. Um, right. And then a third who, you know, kind of was with it and it was just like, I want to see if this is actually going to be a great product for me. So, right. so we tried to cover a few different personas so that we weren't building anything too specific. I love that. So you got the, some of the maybe the older folks that may have been sort of technophobic, so to speak, with index yeah. cards moving over to the savvy. I love that. And and uh, all right, so you got three to five core folks that you've got good energy from that you felt like you can continue going back to them. How often would you go back? Would you say once every couple of weeks? What was the interval looking like? Yeah, I think, you know, initially our development cycles were a bit long. So they were like two to three months. And part of it is because we were ramping people up. Like we had to onboard um, 
employees. Uh, I was doing some fundraising. So yeah. given all of that, we just didn't have yeah. as much time. So what we would do is we would just collect feedback. Uh, you know, online, and then we would sit there and, like you mentioned, every couple months we okay. would go back and reach out to the customers. When yeah. I had a full-time PM, I actually had her call once a month and do like a quick five-minute survey. We'd pick a different group of customers every time, okay. um, but but initially it was just like every couple months. Once we had an idea for the direction that we were going in we'd reach out to some loyal customers and get feedback. How did you cut through the bull? Like most people are always like nice and like oh that looks nice and you know secretly they're never going to use it or never going to come back to the restaurant. How do you what was are, do you have any secrets you want to share there? Like how do you cut through the crap? Like cut through the niceness. Yeah, well so there's two things that we did. Um, the first is for for some people who were like really really picky, um, we actually said, okay, would, would you pay us to develop this, right? Because some people were like, oh, you're not developing any of the features that we want. And I was like, well, that's because we're building a general product here. If you want to pay us extra, then right. we'll develop what you want. And some people actually did bite. So we okay. did it just for them. Okay. Um, and then for the others, what we would say is, look, we can only develop so much. We're a small business just like you, so you know what that means. Right. Um, and we want you to you know, vote on the particular feature that you think is important. I now, see. that got a little bit hairy, right? Because what we ended up with was like one vote for like 10 things. Okay. Um, so, so at that point, we kind of decided we needed to make an executive decision and pick what we were hearing from just, you know, from everyone rather than a, a few people. Gotcha. Um, and then we actually also looked at metrics, right? So we went into our database, we looked at the features people were using, nice. we looked at the things people weren't using, and for the things that they weren't using, um, we decided we would give it a little bit of time, but yeah. if we right. felt so like no one was using it, either to shut it down than words, or right? the to like said, figure something to, out that we know, weren't investing a lot of time um, into How did developing it, when it further. You, uh, got down so, the so that's the approach that we took. Them to plot uh, but yeah, it was definitely you know, was a, 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 a combination of some anecdotal evidence, talking to customers, and then some metrics looking at the usage. Gotcha. Yeah, it did. I think, you know, especially for some of these people that got vo vocal with us and were like, you guys just aren't building any of the things. I mean, you say you're building things, but you never build the things that I want. You know, we had to we had to say, look, we're, we're building for the general public here, right. um, not just for your particular studio. Yeah. So if there are things that you absolutely need, then we'll be willing to fast track that. Uh, and like I said, a couple of people usually would bite, um, but then other people would be like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, it's not that important to me. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we'd also kind of give them a little bit of understanding. So um, what we would say is, you know, we can build maybe one thing that you specify, but we can't build 10 things, right? So if you've got a laundry list, then you need to prioritize what's the most important um, in order for us to deliver this. And we'd also kind of lump it back into bigger buckets, right? Were they doing, were they requesting yeah. something because it was a, an issue of revenue for them? or customer acquisition for them, you know, what were the things that they were asking, not just, oh, this is great because it'll save me time, um, but maybe I'm doing something really quirky, right? Because that's yeah. the other thing with small business owners, sometimes they'll have these really zany ways of running their business, right. and we don't want to encourage that kind of behavior. Right, right, so we had, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah, we had, we had studios who would say, well, we want to give people a lot of extensions. And we said, you know, we don't believe that you should give. I mean, it's, it's your business after all, but we don't want to encourage that behavior because we think people will yeah, go out of business. Besides, besides and just so the, uh, here's the here's a and what here's the a tough provides. workaround How much of, uh, that you can use. Um, but we um, we think that you know, daily in general, people you should expire where, uh, and they should like come I've back and buy before, a new class Business owners they can get really studio. protective gotcha. of their I love it. Yeah, I love it. In a way, you're sort of helping them manage their business in a in a good way by best practices. Just the product on the you know what it looks like on the outside. How much of the insides of their businesses did you start uncovering with this very simple tool? Oh, 
Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the way I see it is like our best businesses are using us almost every day because yeah. they're checking in every student that comes into their studio. Mm -hmm. They are recording all the purchases to keep track of their revenue. And then they're re-engaging with those customers. So on, on some level, we are very much embedded in the um, relationship that they have with their customer as well as you know how that translates then to to revenue so we got pretty into the um, nitty-gritty of it okay. the couple things that we didn't do was like you know we don't manage vendor relationships um, we don't do payroll um, you know we don't help them uh, necessarily with like all of their uh, expenses um, but we do at the end of the year give them a snapshot of their data so that they can send it oh. to their accountants um, cool. so so we're involved with some high level yeah some high level business processes as well um, and I think like I said for a lot of these owners especially the sole proprietors mm -hmm. they don't they can't even hire an assistant because an assistant's right. like ten dollars an hour yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? and a lot money. of assistants need to yeah. work like Okay. Exactly, yeah. like 10 hours volume, a week yeah. or something yeah, like yeah. that. It's like $100. Yeah. So yeah. what we started to see is people were yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, using us instead part, of a right? personal like, uh, assistant. A lot of people so I, I, would, I really want to get an FM engineer, but you know, I'm so enjoying this. Like uh, I want to talk about how you build a team and how you raise some money. Maybe we'll have you come back on and do FEM engineer because this is great. This whole thing is why we do the show. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't this why we do the show? And, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's talk. Let's let's talk about that. Uh, the ball rolling piece. So you you started getting you you know obviously you know you're a developer so you can build some of the stuff but you can't do everything because you need to also hire people you've got to maybe raise some money once you think you've got some traction How, walk us through a little bit of that timeline pretty much like wh when did you start looking around for some funding uh, was it like a month in talk to us about that yeah um, well you know I gotten a lot of good advice from people saying don't bother getting funding before you have a product and before you have some paying customers so I actually delayed our fundraise until uh, the, the following year so until we had that first product and first paying customers okay. so that first year um, was literally me like I said spending more than the first half of the year doing customer development and then roping in other people like my team to do this okay. um, and I was also bootstrapping the business so I was actually paying um, myself uh, my co-founder and one developer salary so okay. that's that's where we started and then towards the end of the year as we were getting pretty confident about launching um, I decided we needed to hire another designer and another developer um, okay. so towards the end of the first year we were a team of about three uh, yeah three people um, and what was you know difficult was convincing people that software for these small businesses matters yeah. right because there certainly had a number of options it's not like my developers couldn't go and work somewhere else um, same thing with with design so a lot of that first year was understanding not only our customers but understanding uh, employees and putting in place a good development process. Well, and so, so you're, you're yeah. in Silicon Valley, you're in Mountain View-ish area, and obviously talent for developers and designers is like scorching hot. It's really hard to get people to join on sometimes. Mm -hmm. How, what did you do? What kind of care did you throw out to these folks? Yeah, so I was actually um, pretty lucky in that, uh, you know, coming from Mint, people actually wanted to work for me, but okay. they the harder part was getting them to work for below market rate okay. and, right so that that was the harder challenge because I was yeah. bootstrapping and yeah. so I didn't have trouble getting people interested um, right. and most of the people that came to work for me um, learned about what I was doing uh, through speaking so I, I you know I do a lot of speaking on entrepreneurship on engineering on leadership and so as I would go into these conferences people would reach out and they'd establish some level of rapport and then they'd say you know would love to help any way you can and I just right. kind of filed that in the back of my head right. um, and then of course a few months later I'd be like hey remember how you said you wanted to right. help that's right yeah 
Yeah. So, so I, I would usually get people um, ramped up, and I, what I would do is uh, I'd go after the folks who were freelancers, because the thing about freelancers is you don't have to um, get them to work full time on your project, especially when you're not sure about the relationship. Right now, it's a little bit tricky because they're smart enough to manage their time. They can go off and do their own project, or they might not be invested in yours. So those were some of the issues that I had to, to deal with eventually. But initially, I didn't have to sit there and manage all of them. And I could say, hey, let's try a three-month contract, see if we like each other, see if we can make progress, and go from there. Um, so that was my initial approach to, to hiring talent. I love that. So because of the sheer vert, because of your sheer virtue of you being out there and and cha and talking, and you started attracting sort of a little tribe there, and then you just called on these folks when you're ready. Uh, that's really that's a good tip for any entrepreneur to get out there and start giving talks. Obviously. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's also good because you kind of cover a lot of different bases, right? You cover customers. I mean, it's maybe one or two levels removed for my particular type of customer base. Um, but, but still, you're getting out there. Um, but I think it's a great recruiting tactic. It can be a good fundraising tactic, um, but it's not always you know, guaranteed. OK. So um, let's talk about, um, you know, I kind of want to not talk about Femgineer. Maybe do it on another show. But I do want to touch yeah. on Femgineer because we don't have a ton of time. Uh, so uh, let's, let's segue into that. So talk to me about why you're doing this. I mean, you've got your hands full with this membership software. Why this? Yeah, uh, so I started Femgineer six, six and a half years ago, and really it was just a blog on um, engineering and entrepreneurship. Okay. And what started to happen towards the end of last year um, were a few things. Yeah. The first is people were like asking me to write more, and I was like, okay, that's great, but like you said, I've got my hands full. That's right. um, I was getting a lot of interest, like people were also interested in having me come and speak and teach. And so given all of that, I said, well, this is great, but if I'm going to do this, I've got to be paid um, because I've, I'm bootstrapping my business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have a lot of money or time. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So what I did was I basically um, converted the blog into a business and focused it purely on educational services because that's what people were contacting me for, right? They wanted um, either my brain or someone who was involved with Femgineer, their, their brain and their time. Um, so I just began teaching. I started teaching um, our own online course on product development because a lot of people were coming and asking me for kind of the same advice over and over again on product development. Right. So I started doing that. And then I also got invited to uh, teach at Duke University, which is where I'm at now. So I actually moved to the East Coast for a semester. Uh, I'm going to be teaching company formation and product development out here as well. Beautiful. Um, yeah, and so it just it, it became the kind of thing where you know because of the sheer demand, it became a business. Now gotcha. the the kind of key thing was you know I saw a lot of noise in this space where there's obviously a lot of people doing um, a lot of teaching, a lot of education. Yeah, there's a lot of um, And I exactly, and I wanted to focus on one particularly acute problem, which you know we mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation, um, which is retaining women in tech. Right, so there's clearly a number of people that are teaching young women how to code, um, getting them into universities or into boot camps. But once once they're in the industry, you know, it's hard for them to stick around and to actually then climb up into a leadership position. Okay. And so a lot of um, the focus is not just on on educating women, but educating them to be leaders in this industry. Gotcha. And so that's yeah, that's basically become the vision. Um, and of course, doing that through education. Okay, so you said there was a lot there that you covered. So you've got one part, which is just product development, which obviously is gender neutral. Men and women yeah. can obviously learn more about how to co-create with your customer base. And then, then you've got this thing where you're trying to help women become more leaders within these tech companies. So uh, why not just split off the product? development stuff and, and, and to another thing and you know what I mean it feels a little bit like a, an overlap and two different things yeah so um, it's a little bit tricky you know given that once again there's a lot of noise in the space uh, and so the way that the way that we're thinking about it is you know women who are involved in tech have to have or rather people that are involved in tech need to have a number of skills right product development is one Communication is another, and leadership is the third. 
Um, and then kind of embedded in there is maybe something very, very technical, right? And we're kind of staying away from that very, very technical space right now. Eventually, we will add, add that on as a service. Um, but we wanted to center the conversation around uh, this theme of product development because that's where all the problems stem from, right? That's where people get frustrated with their teammates because they're like, we're not able to ship because you're being a jerk to me and you know, you're know you not uh, willing to listen to my ideas, right? Or I'm just not getting through. Um, mm. Same thing with feeling a sense of efficacy, right? It's if they're able to ship, if they're able to contribute um, to the code base or to the product development, then they feel like I am part of this team. Ah, so see. that's why, yeah, so that's why we wanted to kind of center the conversation around product development. Um, because once again, it kind of comes back to some immediate skills that people can take away and, and go and, and apply to their careers. But within that context, um, we, we want to have these offshoots of better communication, better team management, um, better development processes. So yeah, it's, it's all kind of you know, worked in there. Um, and we have a few different a few different things that we do. You know, we do have the online course. We have monthly events. We have um, online mentorship as well. And part of it is because we're also experimenting with what's going to resonate um, with people. You know, what do they want to see? How is the composition of some of these students? Are, are you finding the majority of them to be female? Because obviously the female slant, or do you, is it half and half? Where, where are we at? I think, you know, given our readership just on the, the blog, it's about half and half. Because like you okay. said, it's, it's gender neutral uh, right. in terms of the topics. Mm -hmm. The class composition tends to be about 80-20. So about 80% of them are women, 20% are, are men. Um, and then even in our mentoring sessions, um, they, they tend to be like 90-10, um, okay. or like sometimes even 99% you know, women, um, okay. because they're not able to get this sort of mentorship anywhere else. And right. I think a lot of the men are already getting mentorship, either from their peers or their supervisors, or they've got a good network in place. Um, okay. And so that tends to be how we skew. So I'm, I'm, So let me just recap here. So you're saying through a product development, just the sheer virtue of, of focusing on that, you're almost giving these women sort of another weapon in the arsenal to say, hey, listen to me. I, I know what these people are wanting. We should focus on development of the product. And so you're kind of using that as a sort of spear to try to get them to leader, leadership position. Am I getting that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because when, when we fixate the con conversation too much around gender, that, then that so companies and, and teams are um, like, what's the ROI? What are we going to get out of this, right? And I, I kind of hate uh, that, but I understand it all comes back to the, bottom line, and it also comes back to skills, the right? Side. So it's teaching you, them the uh, skills that are going to directly apply to what they're doing when they go back to their company, and product development is that you know initial piece of the puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you know, we we wanted to have a couple. We had wanted to have a couple things unique about our culture. So the first is we wanted to have a remote culture, um, because both my co-founder and I um, not only like to travel, but we don't want to be wedded to a particular location. You know, it's just like having to commute and deal with all of that. So we wanted to have some flexibility in our schedule, um, and that meant that we had to have a better system of communication. And so that became really, really important to us, um, which also meant then that the development cycle would get affected, right? Because it's not like we were just everyone sitting there and able to chat with each other. So, so that was one lesson that I learned. It was like how to build a productive remote culture and okay. one that okay. you know communicates. Um, the sort of second thing that we started playing around with was you know this idea that there are no linchpins. Right, meaning that product will get shipped and things will just, you know, happen without, um, you know, the CEO or whomever like needing to sign off on everything. Right. Oh, yeah, so yeah. how can we build uh, a team that's going to keep shipping product um, without, you know, needing to do needing to get sign off? Um, and then the third element was that, yeah. you know, we're all going to kind of help each other because the theory was if we educate one another, whether it's onboarding or whether somebody's stuck or we do pair programming, the idea is it's actually going to make us more efficient, 
right? Because if so-and-so is not stuck, then most likely they're going to be able to contribute to shipping the product mm -hmm. rather than being like, oh, I can't help you. Like, I'm wow. too busy working on whatever it is I'm working on, right? right, right so right. we kind of wanted to build that collaborative sense um, cool. and, and put the emphasis on learning. And that was tough because we would spend sometimes like three to six months purely on learning and not even doing um, a lot of development. Like, we would ship very little because okay. there would be these long learning curves. Gotcha. So, uh, in terms of the virtual company culture, uh, do you guys have like a like a sort of a hangout or Skype sessions once a week, or how do you guys get everybody together? Talk to us a little about that. Yeah. So now we're a little bit more part time, like I said, just given how much I'm working on Femgineer. Um, but typically, we uh, we have done weekly all hand all hands meetings, and we will do a hangout for that. Um, we'll also have chat open, um, something like a campfire where people can say, hey, I've got this like, customer issue, and then someone will either respond um, or we go through and kind of read what's happened over the course of a day if we haven't had time to hang yeah. out there. Um, okay. The other thing is we, uh, we use Pivotal Tracker so we can track all of the engineering work that's being done. Very and we, you know, It's pretty easy to then see if someone is telling the truth about completing a project or not, right? It shouldn't, okay. shouldn't be it should be really obvious when people right. are making contributions and when they're right. just Right, you know, not around. Right, 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 and they're giving you blowing smoke. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. All right, so you're looking at you're looking at all the commits. You're seeing all that go. All right, so um, uh, really briefly, uh, now that you've got a, I guess a, a pretty decent product and you've got some paying customers, how are you plan? How are you really growing uh, the customer acquisition? I, do you do a lot of blogging because I know that content marketing was a big thing for Mint. Uh, are you doing pay per click? Are you doing media buying? What, what are your channels? Yeah, so that's actually been our, our toughest challenge this year. Um, in the past, we did a lot of blogging, and we're now starting to see that while that's attracting a lot of traffic, um, mm -hmm. it's not actually convert. It's not converting as well as we would like. Really? So that's kind of yeah. So that's kind of the. I mean, people come and they're like, "Oh, great! I have all this free information," um, but they're not seeing it as now you need to buy you know right. our product because we're delivering this. So that's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, you know, honestly, it's kind of getting back to basics. So a couple things that we've started to do are um, some phone calls, not not sales calls in the sense like, hey, buy our product, but just, hey, did you even know that we existed? Because a lot of times people um, know that our competitors exist, but they don't know that we exist. Okay, so it's so getting as, on the phone. As you know, the small business, uh, the owner has been bombarded with emails and phones. How do you cut through? Are you guys just leaving messages saying, hey, this is Pranima from Busy Blah Blah Blah. I know you guys are really busy, but we're doing this great. So, uh, Tell us about that. How, how do you get them through? Yeah. Well, we actually do a couple things. So we don't just call everybody and anybody. Um, so we've got kind of two funnels. The first is we've got our inbound, right, people yeah. who call us. And right. for the people that call us, we kind of take that as license to then bombard them because they've made the initial point of contact, right? Okay. They're actually interested. Okay. So if we do that, then, then we've got them on a frequent calling, calling list. If they haven't, right, then typically what we do is we've got a second list of anybody who has opened a new studio business, mm -hmm. and we want to just call them and say, hey, congratulations on opening your studio. Just want to let you know mm -hmm. if you decide you know, to go with a vendor, we're one option. And that's it. Kind of leave it open-ended. Gotcha. Um, and start the conversation because what we've noticed is even when a lot of studios open, um, they don't, especially if they're really small, um, they're not always thinking about studio management. They're thinking about it maybe six months to one year after. Mm -hmm. um, some people are, but a lot of people aren't. Mm -hmm. So even if we can just plant a seed of, you know, here we exist, then, then that's fine. And then from there, um, we actually have to do what I call like a number of different touch points. So okay. we'll send them, like you said, we'll send them an email. Um, we'll actually send them paper mail. We'll send them a postcard or right, a flyer. Love that. love that, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it's because, <laughs> surprisingly enough, we've had business owners say, oh, after I got your email, your phone call, your postcard, right. and yeah. you know, then a flyer, I was like, yeah, maybe I should give you a try. And I was Absolutely. like, wow, it took that yeah. many touch points yeah. to get you, right? To get them in, so, yeah. So a lot of it is keeping okay. keeping that fresh. Um, uh, and then, really, br really briefly, this is a great topic. I, uh, are you using any um, marketing automation software like Infusionsoft? Are using what, what are you? Are you just Excel? How are you guys managing this process? The phone yeah. calls, the emails, the the postcard, the follow up, all that kind of thing. 
Um, mostly high rise, so 37 signals high rise. Oh, wow. um, okay. In there, yeah, in there we've got all of our leads. Um, we've got all of the deals that we've closed. Um, and then we usually do get a couple spreadsheets full of new businesses. Okay. Um, and then we have to go and you know hire somebody on Mechanical Turk or not to, to look up their email, their phone number, and their physical address. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how we have our funnel created. So, so do you? Are you? Um, who's doing the? Who's doing the phone calling? Are you? Are you doing that overseas? Are you doing that here in the states? Yeah, most of um, most of our business is all here in this. I mean, most of our employees are here in the states. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have people that typically do um, a few hours of calls. I have people on the team actually doing the calls um, okay. because once again, they understand the product, they understand the customer base, so they're going to be better at it. Um, and and mind you, the the point of the calls isn't to close deals, right? right. That's not. It, they're yeah. more like account managers. Yeah. Um, and and so we and we also know that, uh, like you mentioned, these business owners are getting bombarded. Let me ask a couple questions. That they're quick, not going to uh, make a decision about the, on the, the phone. Branding, right? And so, uh, and so if we even sense the, that they don't um, like getting calls, like right? If they say CrossFit, email us or send us info, you, then you we'll most likely you not do a second or third call like for another you know, couple weeks or a couple months. Did the yoga studios like it? If you come and this is really great. I'm I'm loving this conversation. Yeah, so um, you know, when we first started, we were really, really yoga centric. Like, if you looked at the home page, um, there was just like yoga people everywhere. Right. And since then, you know, we've we've okay. gone a little bit broader, but we've still kept it pretty yoga centric. Like, if you read our posts, um, we try to rank highly for those kind of keywords and SEO. Right. Um, and and instead, what we kind of rely on is people will see that we are yoga software and then say, can I use it for my dance studio? Or can mm -hmm. I use it for my music business? Uh -huh. And we sort of have those kind of natural conversations. Yeah. Right. So I don't mind that we are very, very vertical focused. Um, you know, eventually we will have things that are a little bit more branded for the personal trainer, for the martial arts business. Mm -hmm. But for right now, we're still kind of keeping that yoga focus and um, the other thing is a lot of these people still talk to each other and are, are still getting the word out about what they use. Um, gotcha. So we yeah, haven't, that's awesome. I mean, I you know, see the sat there being created the same, but, you know, a whole lot of different, we, we do have some pages, the, like some landing pages visual, the for CrossFit the photo, versus dance, you know, and if you um, yoga, but overall we're uh, keeping that, that, you that yoga focus and we get people who say, hey, I want to use this for my business as well, is that okay? And then we say, sure, but we're not going to create anything specific for your niche just yet. Are you getting word of mouth that way? Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we're not Yeah, and we're not we're not opposed like if somebody sees CrossFit or sees yoga and they're like, "Oh, I'm CrossFit. I'm not interested." Mm -hmm. That's okay with us. Right? We actually we're okay with losing business that way because we want to we really in that, you know, in the early adopter camp, we really want to attract the people who just really love it, um, think it's a product just for them, and we'll go out and evangelize more. So right. I would rather have that than then be like, oh, well, yeah. we run CrossFit this way, and you don't have this feature, and right. then, you know, we're really unhappy, and they cancel, like, within a month, right? Yeah. So yeah. we'd rather kind of fine-tune who we're after. All right, so let's uh, quickly segue into the funding. So uh, you got some customers. It's about a year in, you're saying. Uh, how did you first, uh, did you go out to people that you knew, and, and how much money did you end up raising? Yeah, so um, so we raised a little under half a million in our first raise. This was uh, April 2011. Okay. Um, and that basically took us um, to about the end of 2012. So that was the end of last year. And then um, towards the end of last year, we kind of had to you know, do this do or die situation of, well, we're most likely not going to get Series A funding because it's just not looking like positive. Um, we have a couple options. We can either 
you know, do what everyone else is doing and sell our souls, <laughs> you know, just like shut the business down, or we can, you know, figure out another way to get to a break-even point. Um, and so that's that's when um, we decided let's 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 go back to bootstrapping. Um, let's go back to you know working part time on the product. Let's keep the customers we have. Let's keep generating revenue, um, but let's not shut it down because we were you know we were kind of having the mm -hmm. um, the response of love or hate where people like either really loved our product and they would use it for like years on end. Like it was so funny. Just this week, I lost my first customer who has been with us for two and a half years and oh. it's just that his business has grown so much that he's like I need something more right and and oh, our focus okay. is super small so we're yeah. like okay we, we totally understand we appreciate that you've been with us for as long as you have right. um, so given that we knew we had pretty high retention we kind of wanted to keep that theme yeah, 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 um, yeah. and and then the people who like you know didn't want to use us it was because they either needed something more or they just didn't get it um, so, so kind of given those two spectrums, we were like, let's let's keep this alive. Um, we're obviously making enough to like, you know, have the servers operating um, and you know paying all our bills, but we're not making enough to like pay for everybody to develop full time. Right. Um, and so we've kind of shifted our focus. And and the interesting thing is, like I said, because we were a remote team, because we kind of put in the energy early on to make this as self-sustaining a product as possible. Um, it's given us the freedom to, you know, do other things and not have to shut it down um, and not have to worry about getting another round of funding. Gotcha. Well, I, I, you know, I really love the fact that you guys kept it around because it sounds like you did a lot of work in that customer development. And, um, you know, as, uh, why do you suppose it was hard getting that Series A? Are they, are they just angels or investment? They, they just want to see the, the the hockey stick. What do you think was the issue there? Yeah, well, I think, so there's a couple things. The first is, um, you know, my own stubbornness to go vertical by vertical. Uh, you know, people okay. wanted to Absolutely. see that we already had, like, 10 verticals on our platform. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I really want to keep the yoga focus first and dig into that deeply before yeah. I go on to something else. Okay. Um, so I was kind of unwilling to compromise because I know that as you become broader, yeah. you start to lose some loyalty in your customer yeah. base, yeah. right? Absolutely, so that, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So that was the first, and then the second um, was strange. You know, they just they wanted to see more traction, like they wanted to see more monthly recurring revenue, um, to the point where they wanted to see as much as we were like asking them for funding. So I was like, okay. well, this is kind of a ridiculous conversation. Right. Like, you want me to make you know, this much money, but that's what I'm asking you for. So right. if I had that, I wouldn't be here, like, talking right, to you right, right Every now, month, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, so, so, they, they, so that, they want these crazy big payouts or whatever. Yeah, yeah it doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah, and, and I think the third was, I think a lot of people were just seeing this um, as a small market rather than the potential to... Um, change a lot of different types of businesses that all yeah, operate. I applaud you for sticking to your guns right? with like the yoga as a, stuff because that's where you so started. That's where your roots are. To, I think you know, working the, the VC with uh, uh, nonprofits and other membership be, like, organizations. How can we scale this thing um, but it's a matter like, you know, of owning a couple like markets first. Payoff where, so you know, for the entrepreneur, for the startup, you just want a profitable business. You know, that grows a big market. And we were still kind of going one at a time. Would you? And doing the pushback is is great. Yeah. Absolutely, I completely agree with Jeff. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I, 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 think you should grind this out and grow it to be a very nice business. Yeah, grind it out. Absolutely. Um, so uh, going back to the the blogging and the and the content marketing bit, because I know Mint sort of made their name in content marketing. What what happened, Pranima? How come you guys weren't able to convert these guys? What, were you? Do, do, do you think maybe you should have given away stuff in exchange for the email and then hit them harder with the with trying to get them to convert there, or was it just a lot of people bouncing, just reading and then leaving and never coming back? What was going on? Yeah, well, um, two things. So the first is search volume, um, right? So even though we can create a lot of content, if the search volume isn't there, then it doesn't matter how much content we're creating, right? 
So, so that's kind of the first thing that we learned. And we did a lot of tweaks. Like we started off being very general, um, you know, just appealing to all small businesses. We actually have a second blog that, if you go look at it, is, is very general. And um, we saw a high balance rate. So then we decided, okay, let's get really focused on yoga and servicing these businesses. Right. And then um, we were getting a better conversion rate, but still not conversion from free to pay. Right, okay. so the, the trial users, that's kind of the sticky point that we're at right now where we need to get a larger volume of people who are going to convert from the free to the pay um, yeah. rather than just coming in and reading the content. So we know what we need to do some, some work around that um, yeah. in making the messaging clearer. Um, and I think the, the other thing isn't just the content alone. Um, I, I, the one my, my gut's telling me like the next thing that I'm going to try is um, having some some very specific guides, and I think uh, having those guides then fit into the product will make it a little bit clearer what the value proposition is, right? Rather than just saying here's how to run your business, it's like right. here's how to run your business um, the shitty way, and here's how to do it with BusyBee. So gotcha. you know, sign up now for BusyBee, right? So making it a little bit clearer as to like how their business is going to improve. So that's kind of the next step that I see in content marketing. Yeah. Um, the other is we kind of did this approach of partnering with some other blogs um, that were in yoga and fitness. And I think, um, once again, it's uh, it, it, there's a lot of practitioners that read these blogs, but there's not a lot of studio owners that read these blogs, right? Ah. So. Yeah, so, so we actually think we need to go a little bit broader. Like we need to go to the entrepreneur.com um, and some of, some of the, the larger small business blogs um, okay. and partner with them rather than keeping too, um, too focused. Are you even remotely considering doing any uh, display advertising or any of that to actually paid forms? Yeah. Or uh, have you experimented and the ROI just wasn't there? Or? Um, yeah, it's it is there. We have we have experimented um, a lot, but my you know my theory is always that um, you know SEO always wins out, and it's it's great to to you know kick in um, initially with some SEM, but once you turn it off, it's it's gone, right? So right. I kind of wanted to take a little bit of a longer term strategy. So yeah, yeah. initially we we were doing a lot of ads. Um, we've you know played around with that. We've played around with retargeting, mm -hmm. um, but I just was like we we see conversions but it was kind of pricey to the point where I was just like okay let's let's revisit this um, okay. when we have a more solid understanding of what our keywords are what we want to rank highly for gotcha okay. gotcha wow yeah this this has been a really great session you've covered so much here uh, everything from bootstrapping this thing to building it out and then of course doing this engineer and coming up with the courses and uh, I don't know how you're finding the time to do all this stuff. How do you how do you manage your day? Well, I don't do everything at once, right? I think that's kind of the big myth. It's like people think I just I'm like teaching and writing code and doing everything. I don't. Um, it's you know it's kind of constant context switching. Um, being a yogi helps because you know it kind of keeps you centered and relaxed. Okay. Right. Um, and the other thing is I, I kind of just work off of priorities, right? So it, the priorities being either yeah. customer requests you, you or make business it, You make goals. it sound so easy. Um, uh, any and then everything out there else for the is like a nice to have you know, that, uh, that are maybe if I have an hour or two, I'll get to. Um, get but in general, I kind of make sure that I'm always operating um, off of what I've prioritized as my work. Right, right. Well, uh, I think that puts a good bow on our show today. Jeff, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Yeah, you know, I think, and I had a, a, ment a mentee this morning actually, like, um, tell me all the things that were worrying her, right? And she's got this just really long list. And I said, okay, so the amount of time that you're spending worrying, like, actually worrying, <laughs> right, is a large portion of your day. And it's, it's hard to turn that off, right? It's kind of a habit. But if you could even take half of that, you know, over the next, like, week or month and cut that down, You'll, you'll start to then make more progress, right? Because you'll start to see um, how you can improve your business, how you can get out of situations rather than like, you know, oh my God, I'm, my business is going to like close down or I hate my boss, right? So a lot of it is kind of reframing some of your negative thoughts. Yeah. Uh, and I find that like that's where a, 
bulk of people spend their time is just going through the, the negative talk of like, oh, well, it's not working, or oh, that's like the 10th sales call that someone has you know, slammed the phone on me, and it's like, okay, great, we'll make the 11th one, and make the 12th one, because mostly, likely, when you get to that 13th, 14th one, someone's gonna respond, right? It's like the sheer number sometimes, but we can't get discouraged in those early moments. Um, and let that kind of suck the life out of us. And, and if you do, it's like, okay, take a break, oh, motivation go to something for else, listening. and come right. back. I really uh, appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of it is kind of like you, even if you don't want to be positive. Yeah. Even no. If but you if you know you're out like, there and trying like, to do like, it, it's uh, so if it's, easy if to it's get it's down dream, on yourself. You, but you have to remind not, yourself then, of your goals and you know, keep stay happy it. doing what you, you're doing. But if you really believe, um, then you kind of have to reframe your thoughts a little bit. I love that. I love that. Yeah. 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 That's great advice. Great advice. Easier so, said than done, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Purnima, um, you know, I think uh, we've taken enough of your time. If people want to get a hold of you, what's a good yeah, email well, or on Twitter? Or how, how do we people get a hold of all of our audience? Yeah, so us. at Purnima is great. I think um, they can just tweet at me. I'm usually pretty responsive on Twitter. So I would recommend that. Cool. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. I, 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 right. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but this has been so helpful. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you both so much for having me. I'm curious to see it as a final video. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and so we'll hopefully check back in in a few months and see how you're doing with all these projects. Great. Thank you. So thank you again. Talk to you later. Yeah.